for about one a month since the pandemic started. And I just like to share my photos and my uh, knowledge. Uh, so feel free to, to jump in at any point. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to give in any of your own information as well, I like these to be interactive. Uh, so let's kick off the presentation here on what we see in the shallows. So the first one I've got here is a lion's mane jelly. Uh, so these can be seen at various depths, including, as you can see in this photo, all the way to the surface. So even when you're snorkeling, you gotta uh, not just look down, but also look straight out. Make sure you're not uh, swimming right into some of those uh, tentacles there and get caught into them. Uh, so these you can see at pretty much any depth there. Uh, they, they get pretty big, the, the, the heads there, and those uh, tentacles can trail quite a ways behind. There's another one that's uh, a little bit uh, deeper. You can't quite see the surface there, but uh, still in the relative shallows. And here's one where the, the bell is kind of in the outer part of its pulse thing. <clears throat> So these do kind of pulse and move somewhat, but they also drift a whole lot with the current. So anytime you get near one, uh, try to be aware of which way the current's pulling the, the jellyfish and which way it's pulling you so that you're not drifting into it. And keeping on the, the jellies topic, uh, moon jellies, uh, much smaller, they're typically around that size, uh, can also be found in the shallows. Find them at various depths. You can also find them at uh, uh, above sea level in the Seidel Aquarium. They've got a, a nice donut shaped tank with, full of moon jellies that uh, circulate around through there. Uh, and I guess on the, the jellies, as far as IDs, uh, the lion's mane jellies are really big and they're usually pretty easy to identify uh, just from the size and also the, the the shape, they've got these kind of lobes on the, the head there. Uh, the moon jellies, as I said, are much smaller. Uh, the tentacles, you don't see them as much on the bottom. And in the center, they've got those four circular shapes there. So those, uh, the pattern of four circles is a distinguishing feature on the moon jellies. And you can also find other jellies. Uh, this particular one, I I'm not sure what the species is, uh, but this one's obviously in the eel grass, so you're probably like 10 feet deep here. So one of the uh, fish species that can be found in the shallows is the tube snout. Uh, so the tube snout is, as it's described, it's a very long, narrow tube shaped. Uh, generally silvery in color. Uh, you might see them really small, you might see them somewhat longer. Uh, they're generally schooling fish as well. Uh, let's see, on this one, I don't know if that's kelp or if that's uh, shadows from the sun, but uh, these can be found fairly shallow as well, as well as uh, on the deeper side. Uh, and they kind of drift around and kind of dart around. Uh, a similar shaped fish, which I don't remember if it was in this presentation or not, was the, the bay pipe fish, but that one bends its body a lot more. So if uh, the fish stays very rigid and straight, you can be pretty sure it's a tube snout. Except here where they're curving a little bit. Uh, but here we've got a, a school of much smaller tube snouts. Uh, and again, they're in eograss, so it's going to be a, a fairly shallow photo here. So again, on the topic of uh, eelgrass, which, as uh, you might know, is generally in the shallower depths, is the shiner perch. So the shiner perch is uh, generally on the small side. Uh, ways to distinguish the shiner perch is they have a very silvery body. Uh, you can sort of see it in this photo. On the side, they have three vertical bars that are yellowish. 
So if you happen to get close enough to it and actually see the side of the fish, uh, you can see those uh, yellow bars there. And here we have a, a large school of both shiner perch and a few other perch mixed in. There's uh, some uh, striped perch, uh, might be pile perch somewhere in there. Uh, but for instance, the one up kind of more top left here, you can still make out that it's a shiner perch because of the general shiner or the perch shape. I mean, you have the relative size, it's smaller than the striped perch down here. Uh, and you've got the, the stripes on it. So here you can uh, see them a little better, another schooling grouping of them. Uh, you can just kind of make out those paler three vertical bars on the sides there. So once you get familiar with what a shiner perch look like, uh, even in less ideal visibility conditions and from a bit further away, you can pick out the, the shape and the, the general coloration. And another one is the striped perch. Uh, so the striped perch is going to be on the bigger side. Uh, the general kind of very tall, skinny fish shape. Uh, the distinguishing features on the striped perch are the horizontal stripes uh, that are generally kind of a bluish tinge to them. Uh, but it's a lot of horizontal stripes. Uh, the rest of the body is kind of a silvery. Uh, Sometimes a, a greenish, grayish coloration as well. So here you can definitely see the, the bluish iridescence on those stripes. And here's a, a small grouping of uh, striped perch. Now this photo was taken in about three feet of water. I literally just walked in at uh, Sun Rock, just kind of stuck my uh, mask in the water just to see what's down there. And sure enough, there's a bunch of fish, fish by my feet. So I grab my camera real quick and snap a shot before they uh, all dart off away from me. So uh, even in very shallow waters, you can find striped perch. Edgar, in that last photo, can you back up? Mm -hmm. What's in the upper left-hand corner? Kind of this shape here. And is it just kelp? Uh, I don't know, it looks more like just rock shapes. Just, oh. yeah, I don't think it's a, an animal of any sort. And, well, it could be a, oh. a branch of some sort. Or, but yeah, I don't think that's a wildlife there. I was like, it <laughs> looks like a fish. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, the, the swoop here does have a, a knot shape for a rock, so it might be more of a branch or a log. That's really well. Sorry to distract you there. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. That's more interesting in my uh, presentations when, you, when people ask questions. So the other perch is the pile perch. Uh, so again, the general perch shape. Uh, they're silvery like the shiner perch, except they're much larger, similar to the striped perch. And the pile perch have uh, one almost full body length, uh, darker vertical band just behind the, the dorsal fin, and then a slightly smaller darker patch uh, towards the tail. But it's generally that uh, one long black bar uh, that people use to distinguish the pile perch. And the way some people remember it is it was a silvery fish until it leaned up against the the black creosote-filled uh, pilings uh, and got some uh, black stuff on its body. So that's how some people remember the, the pile perch. And this one is probably at Titlow, so easily less than 20 feet here. Uh, and as I said with the, the shiner perch, once you start to get familiar with the pile perch uh, size and shape and color, even in this photo, which is not great visibility, kind of blurry. You can still tell it's a pile perch. Uh, you've got the, the pile or the perch shape. You've got the, the vertical dark band there. And 
And the last perch is the kelp perch. So the kelp perch is going to be similar size to the shiner perch, so on the smaller side. Uh, but the kelp perch are not going to be a silvery color. They're going to be this orangish, reddish, sometimes brownish color. Uh, and they sometimes have these little kind of whitish, small blotches on the back, but it's generally the uh, the perch shape and the, the orangish color that you can distinguish them. Uh, and also to not to confuse it with uh, a Puget Sound sculpin, uh, not, not sculpin, uh, Puget Sound rockfish, sorry. Uh, the perch have only one dorsal fin. Uh, the rockfish have two dorsal fins. So if you see a fish roughly that big, orangish, single dorsal fin, uh, it's probably going to be a, a kelp perch. Scott, uh, you have a, a comment or a question? Um, both. <laughs> so I was giving a presentation a couple months ago. Somebody asked me an interesting question about these kelp and surf perch, and I wanted to see if anybody knows: uh, Are these live bearing? Do they give live? Do they give birth to live fishies, or do they lay eggs? I don't know. <laughs> I was included on that for the reef survey, so... Does, does anyone else know? This one stumped me, and I was presenting on the, <laughs> on the surf perch, and I didn't know either. Uh, they are actually live-bearing. So all of these little baby surf perch, like, pile up, and there's a lot of them all tucked into their little bellies, and they just poop them out. <laughs> um, they don't lay eggs. I always wondered why we never saw perch on eggs or guarding eggs like we do with the greenlings and the rockfish. And it's, well, actually, not even rockfish. I think rockfish are live bearing, aren't they? Um, lingcod, just like the greenlings, all we can see eggs for the spotted greenlings and the lingcods. But uh, yeah, these guys actually do carry their young around until they're old enough to, to come out and they let them out. It's interesting. Edgar, I've, I've got a question. Yep. Do all the perch that you just mentioned only have one dorsal fin? Yes. So it's okay. a common feature on the, the perch. That's so if you what, want. That, you can... what it sounded like. I just wanted to make sure I was, mm -hmm. I heard it right. So. Yeah. On these, they've all got the dorsal fins down, but here you can kind of make out the dorsal fin. Uh, here, the striped perch, the dorsal, dorsal fin is more towards the back, but again, the single fin. Uh, and then, well, I can't see too well in any of the shiner perch, but again, you've only got the one dorsal fin. Okay. So yeah, the kelp perch, as their name implies, can frequently be found uh, hanging around kelp, uh, as well as other structure. Uh, but uh, kelp can also be found in the shallower depths, so you can find these uh, in the shallower areas. So also in the shallows, uh, if you happen to have a, a view of the sand itself, you might see some of the, uh, the flatfish. Uh, first one I've introduced here is the southern rock sole. So the southern rock sole is generally uh, one of the larger ones as opposed to the, the sand dabs. Uh, the southern rock sole, uh, as far as some of the distinguishing features on this one, uh, it's got larger eyes, very large lips. Uh, and most of the time, it, I notice these white spots uh, that go around the perimeter. Uh, the sand dabs either don't have those or they're not as prominent. Um, I don't recall if I had a, a photo of it, but the southern rock sole is also the only flatfish in this area that will kind of prop itself up onto its fins. So if you see a, a flatfish that's kind of raised up a little and like it's kind of almost walking on its fins, uh, it's always going to be the rock sole. Here's another one uh, in the kelp. Or the well, yeah, there's kelp as well as uh, eelgrass. So you have the, the larger eyes, the, the fatter lips. So 
So one of the other flatfish uh, is the English sole. Uh, both of these actually also are considered uh, right eye flounders. Uh, so essentially you're seeing the right side of their body, so the eyes migrated to the right side. They're laying on their left side essentially, if you imagine the, the normal fish shape and kind of lay it on its side. Uh, the sand dabs are left eye flounders. Uh, so that's one way to distinguish the, the rock sole and the English sole from the, the sand dabs. So the English sole is generally a, a little narrower than the rock sole and the eyes are much smaller uh, and the mouth is smaller and more towards the, the head or more towards the tip of the head as opposed to kind of along the down below the eyes as well. So here's another English sole. You can see the, the narrower body shape there. And getting back to invertebrates, uh, we've got the various crab species you can see in the shallows. Uh, here we've got the, the Dungeness crab, which most people recognize from the, uh, the grocery store. Uh, the Dungeness crab uh, is generally fairly consistent with the coloration, this brownish orangish color uh, with the, the whitish bottom as well. Uh, it does have kind of ridges or points on the, the front side of its shell here. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what other features to necessarily describe on it, uh, but most people recognize the Dungeness crab, so these can be found fairly shallow as well. So again, we've got the, the eelgrass, so you're going to be probably less than 10 feet here. And another crab species is the red rock crab. Uh, so the coloration of the red rock crab uh, is going to be much more reddish brownish, uh, sometimes a little bit towards the, the purple side, uh, but there's another one that uh, has a lot more purple on it. Uh, but one of the distinguishing features on the red rock crab is at the tips of the claws, uh, they're black. So the, the other larger crabs in this area don't have those black tips. Uh, some of the smaller, more delicate decorated crabs might have colored claw tips. Uh, but if you've got a, a good sized chunky crab, it's going to be a, a red rock crab with those black tips. So here's another one in the eelgrass. Uh, this one is probably just swimming along on top of the eelgrass, either heading out for the dive or heading back from the, the safety stop and happen to spot one and just uh, shooting the photograph down into the sand there. So again, you can see the black tips on the claws and the, the reddish coloration. So the other largish crab in this area is the graceful crab. Uh, so this one, uh, you've got a lot more uh, purplish reddish coloration. Uh, you don't have the, the more drab reddish brown from the rock crab or the, the orange colors from the Dungeness crab. Uh, and also the, the legs, uh, I guess, are a little bit, are, aren't as chunky, and uh, I would almost describe them as a little smoother. Uh, and there are certain ways to distinguish the graceful crab with the, the ridges on the front edge of the shell, but I can never remember uh, what the, the rule of thumb is on those. But there are differences in that feature as well, in case you ever want to look that up. Uh, but if you get one that's got uh, really bright purplish coloration and it doesn't have black tips on the claws, you can be sure it's a graceful crab. And the, the graceful crab, I think, generally are found uh, in somewhat smaller sizes than the, the Dungeness and Red Rock crabs. At least that's been uh, my experience. So here you've got a, a terrible photo of one. You can still see the purplish coloration on the legs, and you can still get a, a tiny view of one of the, the claw tips, and you can see that it's not black. So even from uh, imperfect photos like this, you can still ID it as a graceful crab. And even the octopus go in the shallows. 
Uh, so I've uh, heard a story from one of my dive buddies that uh, they were out at Titlow Beach, and uh, I believe they said they were on their way out, and they were literally standing up in the water, kind of walking in the shallows, getting out of the water, and they disturbed a an octopus that was hiding somewhere in the shallows, right there within fairly waist-deep water. Uh, so octopus even venture quite shallow as well, so keep an eye out for these guys, uh, no matter what depth you're at. So I discovered that it's usually on incoming tides, and that's actually when you'll see if you're out snorkeling on an incoming tide. Um, if you wait until like the tide's about halfway in, a lot of the fish and octopus will actually come up and what they're doing is they're feeding off of all of the scraps of the, that the seagulls cracked open and the crows got into on the beach when the tide was out. Um, and especially on low tides, they'll, they'll chase the tide in just to go off and feed. So it's a really great time to like dive in the shallows and look for these things. Um, with that said, I've also, I mean, yeah, me too. I mean, I've seen red octopus. I had one come up and visit me uh, well, I was just taking a safety stop in like 10 feet of water <laughs> and it, it didn't even care I was there. It was like, hey, how's it going? And I walked right by. I was like, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, those, those incoming tides, they like to chase the, the, the tide and to get all the scraps. Good info. Let's see, so octopus, I guess identifying it as an octopus should be pretty easy. Uh, most people know what they look like. Uh, I won't go into to, too many details on how to distinguish a, a giant Pacific octopus versus a red octopus. Uh, one of the features has to do with uh, the bumps under the eye that are sometimes referred to as eyelashes. Uh, but when they're smaller sizes, it gets really hard to tell the difference between the two. Uh, but generally, most people get excited no matter what kind of octopus it is. It's always a, a, an interesting uh, species to see. and see them uh, move around and uh, get some photos of them. So here we've got another one uh, kind of poking out from some kelp there. So you can also see uh, some of the larger snails in this area, like the Lewis's moon snail. Uh, I've seen these at various depths, but I've definitely seen them in uh, shallower waters, uh, hunting through the eelgrass for whatever they're looking for. So in the eelgrass, and the, you might see some of these guys. Uh, the Lewis's moon snail is possibly the largest snail in this area. Uh, the shell can be pretty big, and that foot can stick out pretty, pretty far. Uh, and you also don't want to get too close to them because they are, uh, uh, I believe, venomous. Uh, not going to kill you, but uh, I've heard that uh, they have something that can poke you and give you some sort of sting. Uh, so yeah, the Lewis's moon snail. Uh, on this one, you can just kind of barely make out the, the spiral shape on the edge of this, uh, the shell here, uh, but it is one of the, the spiral type round shells. Uh, but the foot tends to kind of wrap up around it and kind of disguise that shape somewhat. Edgar, I love that your photo also has a billion little, little tiny snails in, in the sand. <laughs> That's really... Those are, those are fun. Those are those little guys that just flip around every once in a while. Yeah, that might be uh, what it's uh, hunting for here. Uh, what is it? Uh, I think it was a T-Dock. Uh, it was with a couple of divers there. We are kind of heading up at the end of the T-Dock. The so, I don't know, we're probably, what, 20 or 30 feet at most. Uh, we saw two Lewis's moon snails uh, just booking it, just going faster than we've ever seen them. Uh, at first we weren't sure what they were doing, and then we realized that there were these little small snails right in front of them, trying to get out of their way. So the Lewis's moon snails are chasing these other tiny snails to eat them. And you've never seen a snail this big move so fast. They're practically flipping themselves so they would roll down the hill out of the way. So uh, if you happen to, to notice one of these guys when you're in the shallows, or anywhere really, uh, you might want to stop and pause and see if they're just hanging out or if they're on their way somewhere. You kind of marvel at how fast they can sometimes move. So as I mentioned, in the eelgrass. So we've got two of them hanging out there. 
and on the bottom left one again you can s see better the, the spiral shape of the shell. Edgar, it might be worth noting that uh, if you ever see these leather looking collars, they're kind of like made of sand, they're gray, but they're like these round collars. If you see these round collars sitting in the sand, even at low tide when you like go on beach combs, those are the eggs of these guys. They, um, they mix their eggs in with a, a secretion and sand. And they create these really interesting collars. They just basically go in one big gigantic, they go into the sand and go in one big gigantic circle. And then that's, they, the eggs live in there until they're ready to hatch. Yep, I've seen those uh, as well. Uh, another way you might describe it is like a, a tire shape, but if you tried to mold it out of sand. Uh, so that's a, another way that you might describe it. But yeah, they they're, they're fairly big and they are rounded, somewhat half circle, somewhat all, all the way around, but it just kind of curves up and then has a little lip at the edge, like the collar shape. So yeah, the, if you see those, those are the, the Lewis's moon snail uh, egg casings or whatever they're called. So sticking with the mollusks, uh, the opalescent nudibranch is one of the, the nudibranch species you can see in the shallows. Uh, I've seen these on all kinds of structure, but uh, I've also frequently seen them on eelgrass, uh, so in the shallows. So the opalescent nudibranchs from uh, really little baby guys they can barely even make out, they can uh, get reasonably sized. Uh, they're generally kind of mid-sized uh, when I see them on the, the eelgrass. But the distinguishing features on the opalescent nudibranch are these uh, long kind of sausage like serrata on the back uh, and then they've got the, the long rhinophores almost like antennas in the front uh, and they also have these really long oral tentacles sticking out front uh, some of the other similar species uh, don't have the oral tentacles that are quite as long uh, and the one feature that i always cue in on to make sure it's a, an opalescent nudibranch is on the forehead it's got this orange stripe. Uh, the other similar looking species don't have that orange stripe on the forehead. So if you happen to see one large enough and can actually get close enough to, to see it, uh, that's one way to, to be sure you've got an opalescent nudibranch there. So here we've got another one uh, on eelgrass. And the coloration, the body is going to be your kind of translucent white, uh, and the, the serrata on the back are clear with the core going through the middle, and that core can be anywhere from brown to an orange, kind of leaning towards the reds. Uh, and at the tips, it's got uh, sometimes some other lighter color as well. So here we've got a pair of them where you can see the long rhinophores, the long oral tentacles, and that uh, orange stripe on the forehead. And if you can tell from the, uh, the size of the grains in this photo, these guys are really tiny. So another nudibranch that uh, you might not recognize as a nudibranch is the hooded nudibranch. So these guys, I would almost describe as like a Venus flytraps at the head, and then they've got these paddle-like, uh, what look like they might be arms or legs. Uh, and these, the only times I've seen them are on eelgrass, so you're going to be seeing these in the shallows. Uh, I don't know how deep they go. I've only seen them myself a few times. Um, but yeah, eelgrass is a, one of the places where you'll frequently or that they're frequently seen, not that they're frequently seen in general. Here we've got some, uh, a larger grouping of them on the eelgrass. So kind of each of these kind of, I don't know, umbrella shapes with all these uh, I don't know, frills coming out of them, each of those is a distinct uh, nudibranch in this photo. 
So if you're swimming along uh, the eelgrass and you see this kind of whitish, puffy, blobby shape somewhere, you might want to pause and take a closer look and see if it's a hooded nudibranch. So then we go on to the, the sea stars. So here we have the ochre star. So these uh, you'll find definitely in the shallows. Uh, also above the water on a low tide uh, on pilings and rocks and stuff like that. Uh, so this is one of the, the common species that you'll see uh, beach walking and, uh, and tide pools and such. So the ochre stars can get uh, pretty good sized. Uh, and they're always going to be kind of this uh, reddish or, or reddish purplish, sometimes brownish colors. Uh, it varies somewhat, but generally that color palette. Uh, let's see, the ochre star, the, the central disc is also fairly broad as well. Uh, they're fairly kind of thick and chunky starfish. So here we've got a, a large grouping of them, and yeah, you can't quite see the the water surface, but the water surface is only about another foot or two above where the photo cuts off here. Uh, so this photo was uh, very shallow. Uh, I was heading back up at the end of a dive uh, on, a, on a wall, so we were just about to pop our heads above the surface and flag down the, the boat. And speaking of uh, invertebrates moving fast, here we have the sunflower star, uh, which is uh, one of the, the fastest, or probably the fastest uh, sun star in this area. Uh, it's also the largest. It's uh, an apex predator, which will pretty much try and eat anything it can get a hold of. Uh, so the sunflower star can get a few feet wide on the larger size, but uh, you know, thanks to the sea star wasting disease, the larger ones are uh, very infrequently seen these days. Generally, you see ones that are more than a foot, foot and a half width. Uh, the sunflower stars is one of the species with uh, many, many arms. Uh, you can't go by the number of arms, just that there's more than five or six. Uh, so it's one of the many armed starfish. Uh, and this particular one, uh, the color varies a fair bit from this kind of orangish uh, to browns, sometimes blues maybe, yellows, purples. Uh, but the general shape of the, I guess the proportions of the, the disc and the arms uh, is somewhat consistent. Uh, but one of the ways that I distinguish this one from some of the other multi-armed species uh, or many armed species, is the surface texture. So many of the other ones have a much finer, softer texture, whereas the sunflower star, uh, I describe as kind of a, a shag rug uh, texture with all these, in addition to all these spikes and bumps. So if you happen to, to see one of these, uh, again, here we've got an example in the, the eel grass, so fairly shallow. Uh, this one, I think, was Picnic Point, so we were probably, probably even less than 10 feet in this photo here. Uh, but if you happen to run across one, uh, as with the, the Lewis's Moon Snail, why don't you pause, watch it for a bit, see if it's uh, headed somewhere. Uh, these guys can go surprisingly fast uh, for a sea star. You wouldn't, uh, you'd be amazed at how quickly they can uh, run when they're actually chasing something. Uh, also, if you happen to see one, uh, Reef likes to have uh, these reported because they're monitoring these a lot more closely now uh, after the sea star wasting disease and they're trying to monitor the recovery of the species. So this, I believe, is the same one. You can uh, see the texture a little bit better, all the kind of the fuzziness and the the rougher texture and all the spikes as well. And then we have the eccentric sand dollar. Uh, so this is uh, the primary sand dollar species in this area. Uh, most people know what it looks like. It's a 
mostly round shape uh, with this kind of five pointed pattern uh, as with most of the echinoderms that they have a, a five kind of pointed symmetry to them. Uh, when they're alive, they've got this fuzzy grayish blackish patterning on them. Uh, when they die, the fuzziness uh, kind of dies and falls off and you've just got the, the smoother kind of whitish grayish uh, shell. So sand dollars like to kind of half bury themselves in the sand. Sometimes they're laying down and sometimes they're, they prop themselves vertically in the sand uh, as they're somewhat filter feeding. Uh, so you can find them in various positions. Uh, one of the places you can find these is, uh, I believe it was Kopachuk State Park. Uh, and there they are in the intertidal zone as well. Uh, I was there in a low tide once where at the low tide we were practically walking across some of them just to get to the water. So these can be found very shallow. Uh, let's see, I think uh, Fox Island West Wall is another place that I've seen sand dollars as well. So here we've got a, a larger grouping of them. Uh, some of them with the, the more vertical positioning. Uh, so the, the sandals purposely move themselves into that position. It's not just the waves shifting around and, or anything like that. And here you can see some, some color variations from the darker ones to the lighter ones as well. And then we get into some of the, uh, the anemones. So this is probably one of the anemones that uh, most people are familiar with, the pink-tipped green anemone. Uh, so this is one that you're going to see in the intertidal area where, where you're going to see in the tide pools. Uh, these are the ones that uh, you poke and they squirt out at you. Uh, so they can range from kind of really small to, to fairly large. Uh, not quite the, the big plumose anemone large, but good-sized ones. Uh, so from tide pools down to uh, easily 10 or 15 feet, I'm not quite sure how deep these generally go. Uh, so this is a, a shot from a tide pool. Uh, I don't believe this is my photo. I think I grabbed this one from YouTube some, or Google somewhere. Uh, but this is what they look like out of the water. So this is kind of the shape that you might be more familiar with in the, the tide pools. So here they're kind of pulled in, so all the pink tip tentacles are kind of bunched up in the center. Here we've got uh, some more of them. So these you're generally going to see uh, in the, the really, really shallow areas is when I see them uh, on the rocks, sharing re uh, real estate with uh, the tiny barnacles on the rocks. Um, and if the, there's a bit of surge going on, you can kind of sit there and watch them kind of sway in the water. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, anybody have any questions, any comments? Hey, I'm signing off. Have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Bye, Bruce. And hopefully I'll uh, get another one posted next month. Uh, for those of you that uh, are wondering about my background, uh, Shark Week starts on Sunday. So uh, <laughs> check out Discovery Channel or discoveryplus.com and uh, start watching sharks uh, on Sunday all week long. I was holding back from going, look out, Edgar, look out. <laughs> Looks like it's trying to eat you. Perfect. That's kind of why I picked that photo. <laughs> I love it. Well, All right. Good night, everyone. See something uh, can't quite make out. Uh, you seem to be very quiet there. <laughs> I think I got the very end of it, uh, but thank you. Uh, I'd like to, to share my knowledge and uh, educate other people on how to ID these species and uh, make your dives more interesting. Uh, so, I, in my experience, the the more you recognize the uh, 
the more interesting it is, it's not just fish, fish, fish. You get more excited about which species you see. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good night.